Okay, good evening and welcome. I'm Eileen Barrett, a reference and hit local history librarian at the Reading Public Library. Tonight's program is a collaboration between Reading, Linfield, and Melrose Public Libraries. I'd like to thank Erin Lewis from Melrose, Catherine Decker, Samantha Totman, and Abby Porter, all from Linfield. Tonight's program has been generously sponsored by the Friends of the Reading Public Library. This program is being recorded and it will be available at one of our media <laughs> sites. It's a Zoom webinar, so both your camera and mic are off. Therefore, if you have any questions, hover at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little Q&A tab and you can put your question in there. And at the end of John's presentation, will ask the questions and have him answer them. I've enabled captioning, which you can control. On your toolbar, there's something called live transcript. And when you click on it, you have the option to turn it on or off. Our speaker tonight, John Root, is a member of the Ecological Landscapers Association. And he is an accredited organic landscape professional through the Northeast Organic Farming Association. In addition to his work as a landscaper, John leads edible wild plant walks and lectures on a variety of landscaping and nature topics at libraries, nature centers, senior centers, and other venues throughout New England. He also promotes pollinator habitat through his participation in Western Massachusetts Pollinator Network and is active in establishing community orchids, oh, I knew I'd say orchids, orchids <laughs> for local food resilience as a member of Grow Food Amherst and Help Yourself Northampton. We're honored to have you here today, John. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you, Eileen. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone you just mentioned for collaborating with this, uh, for this event. I'm going to turn off my video because you don't need to see me. All you need to see is the slides right now. And I will uh, share my screen. And there we go. Uh, so uh, first I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge that we live on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. So what are beneficials? The, the word beneficials in the title of this program. Beneficial organisms are those that help farmers and gardeners to grow the food and other products that we need uh, that plants provide. And those beneficial organisms are the three Ps, pollinators, predators, and parasites that uh, predators and parasites control pest populations. And pollinators are responsible for genetic diversity. If it wasn't for um, this ability that, that flowers have to lure the, the pollinators in and, and then they get dusted with the pollen and, and bring and carry that pollen um, to a, a flower of a different plant, uh, there would be no diversity uh, and uh, and that would be a, a kind of an evolutionary dead end and a lack of resilience for, for plants uh, to, to be able to cope with changes in the environment in the future. Um, there are a lot of pollinators out there and uh, bees and butterflies are the ones that are perhaps the most familiar, also hummingbirds. Uh, you can ignore that bat in the picture because there are no bats that pollinate flowers here in New England. Uh, but there are other pollinators, uh, moths, wasps, flies, and beetles that also visit flowers. 80% uh, of all plants need pollinators to set seed. The others are uh, wind pollinated. And uh, uh, don't be misled by this slide. It seems like uh, only uh, flowers with large colorful blooms that are herbaceous perennials are, are, are uh, pollinated plants, but that's not the case. There's trees, shrubs uh, that have all different kinds of blooms. Uh, there's so much uh, diversity out there in the, in the plant world, and they all need pollinators. Uh, one third of our food is pollinated, and pollinators make a difference. You can see the, the, uh, that puny strawberry right in the middle. 
all it got was pollen from it from its from itself. It was pollinated uh, with its own pollen. Uh, the one on the right managed to get some pollen that was windborne from other strawberry flowers, but the one on the left uh, uh, was open pollinated. Uh, pollen was delivered from uh, via uh, via pollinators uh, from other flowers, and what a difference that uh, that makes in the size uh, and quality of the fruit. Well, uh, birds are considered beneficial organisms because they, uh, they control pests. So they are, uh, by, uh, by eating insects, they also uh, disperse seeds, which is very important to plants. Uh, there are only a couple of birds that are pollinators here in New England. Those would be the ruby-throated hummingbird and the Baltimore oriole. Uh, bird populations have declined dramatically in the past half century and will continue to do so unless we do a lot of things very differently. Um, and it's not just the numbers, but also diversity of birds and other vertebrates and invertebrates, which is uh, biodiversity is very important for healthy ecosystems to have you know, a, a variety of different species in different niches uh, and, and in a very complex, complex web of life. Um, so when we think about birds and helping them, first we need to make sure we're not harming them. Uh, and one way, unfortunately, that that happens is that large, especially large picture windows, just they look like uh, part of the outdoors, of course, to, to birds. They don't understand the concept of reflection. Uh, up to a billion birds in the U.S. are killed by slamming into these windows every year. And uh, abcbirds.org uh, will offer, uh, will uh, um, describe several ways that you can make your windows more visible to birds. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, these URLs at the bottom of these slides will be shared with everyone um, at the end of this program. You'll be getting an email message with uh, uh, this uh, document that's uh, attracting beneficial resources. So you don't need to worry about uh, writing down all those URLs. Uh, cats kill up to 3.7 billion birds in the U.S. every year. That's both feral and house cats. And one motivation to keep your cat indoors might be realizing that your cat itself might be a victim of other predators. Uh, here are four that, uh, that uh, could make a meal out of a cat. And, and also other cats and dogs on the loose can, uh, can do real damage to your cat. Uh, now, uh, birds, uh, as other wildlife, have suffered tremendously due to habitat loss, agriculture, and uh, both residential and commercial development. Uh, there just aren't enough places for wildlife, uh, uh, not nearly as many as there used to be. And then there's climate change. Uh, and uh, in, impacts of climate change on bird populations include habitat loss from a variety of for a variety of reasons. Um, new pests and diseases will be more prevalent. Disruptions in timing of migration, reproduction, breeding, nesting, and hatching is another consequence of climate change. And since climate change will affect different species differently, bird behavior may no longer be in sync with their food sources and other habitat needs. So what can we do about birds, uh, bird populations declining? Well, it's the same thing that we can do to save our planet from uh, uh, becoming a place that's inhospitable to us, and that's re reducing our consumption and waste. Those are our biggest opportunities as individuals to reduce re greenhouse gas emissions. You can see in this pie chart that over 40% of our carbon footprint is the stuff that we buy, either food or non-food items. So every time you bring out your credit card or, or wallet or, or, um, and you're thinking about buying something, you can consider how, how much you really need that object. Also, you can consider whether that object really has a, a, a much larger carbon footprint uh, than some others might have that you could choose instead. Uh, bird watching connects us to nature and uh, helps us to avoid uh, the, the uh, traps of commercial culture. Who who wants to? Who cares about uh, that? You know, uh, acquiring stuff if you're out in nature and just feeling part of it. Um, Massbird.org is a a website where you can find bird clubs that are near you. And in this time of COVID, many of them have been uh, offering online uh, programs. We're inspired by birds. That's just wonderful to watch them fly and hear them sing and uh, their devotion to each other and to their offspring. Uh, and birds, as all as is true with other uh, 
animals need food, four things. They need food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. Uh, but please do not feed the birds uh, processed baked goods or other junk food. And uh, processed baked goods are junk food because they're usually heavily processed and contain all kinds of things that birds don't need uh, and don't have enough of what they do need, the protein and fat uh, that are so essential for their nourishment. This is the consequence of a bird being fed uh, processed baked goods. It'll never fly again. Uh, so here are some approved foods for songbirds. Eggshells, they're good for roughage as well as calcium. Uh, bananas, apples, raisins. I've been feeding raisins to birds in my bird feeder. It's, it's fun to watch birds to see which ones eat, eat which foods. Uh, hard cheese, peas, corn, oats, uh, squash or pumpkin seeds. Uh, any kind of nuts, these are all popular with birds as well. Um, you can make your own, uh, you know, just look up online and, uh, you know, do it yourself. Homemade bird feeders abound. Uh, if you have an open feeder like this, you're going to need to be quite diligent in cleaning it because birds will foul that open platform. Uh, and you're, um, you probably don't want squirrels to help themselves to all your bird seeds, so there are different ways to prevent them from doing that. Uh, now, it's good to have. Uh, uh, feeders on metal poles because uh, predators can't climb them too easily, or squirrels. Uh, a metal pole that's eight feet long, buried two feet down, will be at just about the right height. And here's the 330 rule. Uh, you don't want your uh, uh, bird feeder um, between three feet and 30 feet away from the window because th that's, the, uh, that's the distance at which the birds are more at risk of, uh, if they're startled by a, a, a bird of prey, for example, they might slam into a window uh, in their haste to escape. And at least 12 feet away, away from vegetation because predators can lurk under in the cover of shrubs or other dense vegetation. So uh, this might, really might be one of the best uh, bird feeders out there. Uh, it's, it's great to be able to see birds up close, uh, uh, mo in most cases, squirrels and predators can't easily reach it. And because you'll be seeing it every day, you will uh, monitor that bird feeder and notice when it needs to be cleaned. And it's fine to feed the birds in summer. There's a Baltimore Oriole enjoying an orange and uh, a bluebird with uh, uh, mealworms that can be bought at, at grocery stores, uh, and that, uh, dead mealworms in, in a bag or, or live, either one, from a pet food store. Uh, evening grosbeaks and other birds also will certainly love a, su a sunflower seed as they do in winter. Uh, if you do f offer sunflower seed, keep the seed dry f and fill the feeders halfway uh, uh, because uh, otherwise the seed at the bottom might become damp and moldy. Uh, and mold can also uh, uh, result from seed and uh, seed shells falling t at the base of the uh, feeder uh, and becoming moist. And then, so if you move the feeders around, you'll prevent the buildup of waste uh, because mold can be toxic and fatal to birds. Clean those feeders regularly, wash every two weeks, rinse and dry before refilling. You can make your own suet. Uh, you can actually just purchase suet from the grocery store and that's, and that's just fine the way it is. Or you could use sortening and add peanut butter to it and heat that, uh, heat them together. And uh, when they're all mixed, uh, you, you add the dry ingredients and uh, cornmeal is, is great. Uh, the, rest, the rest is optional. Um, and you can pour that suet mixture into recycled uh, tin cans or uh, ice cube tray, freeze, that, uh, um, freeze them for a couple hours and they're ready to go. Uh, uh, suet becomes rancid above 50 degrees, so you don't uh, offer suet in the summer. Bird baths uh, don't have to be expensive. Sometimes you can uh, rig something up for no cost at all if you happen to have uh, various things uh, around that, uh, for example, an uh, upside down garbage can lid will serve as a bird bath. Um, and you can uh, buy a fairly inexpensive uh, heating element to, to offer birds um, water in winter. Now, bird boxes uh, are, have specifications depending on which bird you want to attract. And, and uh, uh, allbirds.com will give you the specifications for these uh, eight birds and others as well. 
uh, the box floor, uh, dimensions of the box floor, the dimension of the, the box height, the entrance height, the entrance diameter, and high, how high above the ground that uh, box should be placed. So here is their basic bird box. This happens to be one for uh, bluebirds. Notice how there are three holes at the top for ventilation, and there are hinges so that you can open the box and inspect it and clean it at the end of the season. There are also holes at the bottom for drainage. And notice also that again, the metal pole is a good idea, just like it is for bird feeders. And uh, you want that, uh, ideally, a bird box should be in the shade with a clear flight path for the adults and the, facing, the hole should be facing away from prevailing wind. Now, starlings and house sparrows are not native birds. They are uh, exotics, they're aliens from uh, Europe and they have made themselves uh, far too welcome and they are not welcome as far as we're concerned and, and as far as native birds are concerned. They, uh, not, only, not only do they displace them and, um, uh, and take over their nesting sites and that sort of thing, but they actually kill uh, eggs and chicks. So these birds are not protected by the state and you are free to trap them or harass them if you choose to. Uh, please do not offer colorful bird boxes because they attract the attention of predators and perches also give an advantage, advantage to predators. They can access that hole more easily, but birds don't need a perch at all. They just go right to the hole. Uh, bird boxes should be made just of wood and they should not be dangling. Instead, they should be securely fastened to something. Uh, protect birdhouses from squirrels, which will, if, if they have a chance, just uh, uh, use their sharp teeth and, and make that hole bigger and, and, and make themselves at home uh, by buying, uh, uh, just fastening one of these uh, metal plates with a, a hole in the middle right over that hole. And uh, you, especially if you fasten a box to a tree, you're going to want to protect that box from predators, uh, such as uh, this um, protection offered by this wire cage. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, you're gonna to wanna to clean your birdhouse at the end of the summer, use a nine to one solution of water and bleach and scrub it well. Then put it back outside because it might serve as a, a, a roost. As a matter of fact, you can uh, buy uh, or uh, make your own roost box. Birds really appreciate the chance to huddle together in the winter away from the elements and in the spring, it's going to be fun to offer nesting materials. And there are many things that can, will serve that purpose. Uh, when people groom their pets, they often put their uh, the cat or dog uh, hair out on the, uh, a branch for birds to find it. Uh, and a suet feeder or a mesh bag will work just fine to offer those materials. Uh, caterpillars are the ideal baby food for chicks. Here's the mama uh, black cap chickadee d delivering uh, caterpillars to her chicks and she'll need to find 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to fledge those chicks. That's a lot of caterpillars. Uh, they are ideal because they're nice and soft and they have all the nutrition that those chicks need. Uh, and caterpillars need native plants. This is the main message that has been demonstrated conclusively by this fellow uh, Doug Tallamy, who is, uh, is very dedicated uh, and knowledgeable, especially about caterpillars but, and birds and, and their relationships with each other. He explains that non-native plants just don't offer anything to caterpillars and therefore birds um, uh, suffer because there just aren't enough caterpillars in the neighborhood. Uh, the problem with non-native plants is that they have leaves that uh, caterpillars haven't had time to figure out how to eat yet uh, because leaves have chemical defenses and it, it takes a long time for uh, in evolution for caterpillars to uh, uh, evolve so that they uh, they they can actually digest those uh, toxic chemicals instead of being killed by them. Uh, the best trees, vines, and shrubs to plant for birds are offered by allaboutbirds.org, which is the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology website, and uh, there are so many trees that are great host plants for caterpillars, and therefore uh, birds love them. An oak tree is right at the top of the list. Mulberry fruits are, un are irresistible to birds, and uh, I love them too. Uh, you don't wanna put a mulberry tree over your sidewalk or your driveway because those fruits uh, uh, can be pretty messy. 
Uh, so put it instead in a corner of your yard where no one is going to be tracking in uh, that mess. But uh, you'll you'll uh, be delighted by all the bird visitors who come, uh, and many different species too, uh, who come to a mulberry tree when it's in fruit. Sassafras fruits are also edible for birds. So are elderberries. This is another one of my favorite uh, edible uh, fruits. I make elderberry pancakes, elderberry muffins. I put elderberries in my oat, uh, oatmeal, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so birds love it as well. It's a beautiful shrub. Um, and speaking of beauty, all the viburnums are sensational and, and uh, have all season beauty. We're, we're used to thinking in terms of uh, ornamental plants being exotic uh, from other lands. Uh, I, I, uh, I beg to differ. <laughs> I think that uh, we have a lot of beautiful um, native uh, shrubs, trees, and other plants uh, that are uh, that deserve a place in our landscape. And, and really beauty is in the eye of the beholder because once you understand that they're native plants, uh, then you have a, a sense of them as uh, of being, of belonging here. Uh, er, here's another one, arrowwood, um, maple leaf viburnum, a, a small uh, shrub that grows in the shade uh, in, in the forests. And then the much larger black haw viburnum. Uh, and then uh, the dogwoods, all of them have uh, edible fruit, uh, gray dogwood, uh, red osier dogwood, talk about uh, a spectacularly beautiful uh, shrub in all seasons. Um, white dogwood is a popular tree for both um, landscapers and, uh, and birds. And if you visit arborday.org, you can get 10 free dogwoods uh, simply by making the donation of any amount that you choose. Uh, and you could also get uh, 10 um, red buds, 10 river birches, 10 uh, of any of these half dozen conifers, or one each of these shade trees. Spice bush uh, has uh, the fruit of spice bush is one half fat, 50% fat, which is a great energy uh, source for birds. Uh, and what bush, uh, what what bird can resist? Uh, a blueberry, either high bush or low bush. Uh, and Juneberries are just as delicious as blueberries, in my opinion, and I think birds agree. This is a native tree. It's, it's a fairly small tree uh, compared to uh, uh, maples and oaks, certainly. Um, and it's just uh, gorgeous uh, in any season. And those fruits are uh, quite delectable. Um, then there's hawthorn with edible fruits, crab apple, uh, black cherry and choke cherry are eagerly sought after by birds. Black chokeberry is a native shrub that's often planted as an ornamental, and people aren't even aware that uh, not only birds but but uh, we can also eat these fruits. They they taste pretty bad right off the shrub, but it, but you if you cook them and uh, uh, they're they're transformed and they're just delicious in in many ways, uh, and uh, and they really are a super fruit. Um, in terms of their nutritional and uh, healing uh, properties. So if you wanted to learn more about uh, the, the planting requirements of a particular species, such as this black chokeberry, all you have to do is search for the common name or the Latin name, Aronia melanocarpa, and add the word Missouri in your search engine, and you'll come up with Missouri Botanical Gardens description of that plant. And here uh, it'll tell you where it can grow, how, how big it'll get, uh, information about bloom and uh, its requirements for sun and water. And uh, you'll learn here that, that it tolerates wet soil. And then the last entry here, garden locations where you can find, uh, where you can purchase that plant. And there's more information as well provided uh, for each plant in uh, on that page. So just remember Missouri and, uh, and the plant name and if you're, uh, if you're needing to know this kind of information about plants. Blackberry canes, uh, black raspberry canes are, are two other wild uh, sources of fruit for birds. Uh, staghorn sumac also, that uh, shrub that uh, can be cr pretty aggressive in the environment, uh, but it is a native and uh, birds do eagerly seek out the fruits uh, into the early winter. And speaking of winter, the winterberry holly fruits are available throughout the winter and are sen sensational ornamentally as well. 
northern bayberry is another uh, food source uh, for birds, hungry birds in the middle of winter. Uh, and uh, conifers can offer edible seeds and shelter and places to nest. Uh, and also can be uh, host plants for caterpillars. Uh, incredibly, there are about 200 species of butterfly and, and uh, moth caterpillars that actually eat pine needles, and then birds can swoop in and help themselves. Eastern red cedar also has fruit that birds can eat. Uh, so if you've decided what, what plant you're interested in, you need to figure out if there's a place on your property that, that would be suitable for that plant. Uh, so. Uh, uh, you, uh, if you are aware of that number of hours of sunlight uh, in different places on your property, the moisture and drainage conditions, the soil texture might be sandy or clay or somewhere in between. Loam is the happy medium. Um, and you can find plants that, uh, that will do fine in any of these fairly extreme conditions, but you won't find any plant that can handle compaction. Compacted soil is, is uh, perhaps the, the major um, uh, limiting factor in uh, plant growth uh, on, on landscapes because uh, roots just can't pass through soil that's compacted. Um, so you want to you might want to test for compaction in your soil if there's any question in your mind. Take a straightened uh, coat hanger and plunge it in about one foot into the ground, and then uh, wriggle it around. And if it bends immediately, then you know your soil is compacted. Uh, you can send away for, a, a, you can do a soil test. Um, uh, I live in uh, Amherst and UMass Amherst has a soil testing laboratory and you can send a sample of, of soil if you're curious about the uh, macro and micronutrients and, uh, and the pH and, and the weather uh, um, and the organic content of that soil. Uh, often it's not necessary though. You can just look around on your property and, and if other plants are quite healthy, then it's likely that your uh, that your soil is satisfactory. Um, when you uh, select a, 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 a tree or shrub and you uh, are ready to dig the hole and put in the ground, you, you want to uh, dig a, a, a hole that's much wider than you might think necessary, but no deeper than necessary. Uh, the reason that you want a wide hole is because uh, roots grow outwards, not down uh, primarily. That's, that's for uh, 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 maximum absorption of water and nutrients, which tend to be more abundant near the surface of the soil. So if you dig a wide hole, it'll make it easier for those roots to, to move out uh, and uh, um, seek in, 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 uh, in search of those water, uh, that water and nutrients that they need. And if you uh, keep this topsoil and subsoil separate, then you can return the uh, subsoil first and then the topsoil uh, after you've placed the plant in the ground. Uh, mulch uh, is, uh, is very helpful in terms of com uh, keeping competition back because even, uh, even uh, grass competes for water and nutrients. It also keeps the soil moist and cool and uh, keeps out weeds. And if you create a, a kind of a rim around the plant, there's a, a kind of a bowl shape effect so that when you irrigate the plant or when it rains, that water is held in. And don't forget to water your plant through dry spells for at least the first couple of years for trees and shrubs uh, when they're uh, saplings, they're, they're vulnerable, more vulnerable to droughts. And they're also vulnerable to hungry vegetarians out there, deer, woodchuck, rabbits, uh, rodents, etc. So you might want to consider protecting uh, your saplings uh, from hungry uh, animals, especially in the winter. Uh, Virginia creeper is another fruit that birds eat, but uh, we cannot eat. Um, humans and, and birds alike uh, appreciate grapes. Both the riverbank grape and fox grape are native grapes here in New England. Wild honeysuckle is a fruit that catbirds and mockingbirds in particular like, and they can build their nest in the tangle of vines as well. Uh, and ground covers like bearberry. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, ground cover that uh, is evergreen and needs a lot of sun. Um, and let's not forget about uh, sunflowers. What bird wouldn't eagerly eat sunflowers, but there are other uh, related uh, plants in the aster family. Black-eyed Susan also has edible seeds. So does purple coneflower and other uh, plants in the, in the aster family 
uh, and, um, and all the plants, in fact, on this page are in the aster family except for sedum. Um, so in the winter, uh, if you leave your seed stalk standing, then, then birds can help themselves to those seeds that remain. Um, and uh, you can also leave the leaves under your tree, if at all possible. The reason for, uh, for doing this, especially underneath trees, is, be, is that uh, 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 the, uh, the larvae, the caterpillars, drop down from the trees. Uh, and if, if they end up on bare soil or, or, or lawn, that, that's, that's not an environment where they can survive the winter. Um, leave dead trees and snags for birds and other wildlife uh, if they're not a hazard for humans or your, or your dwelling. Brush piles are great, the three S's, sanctuary, shelter, and snacks for birds and other critters. Uh, now to review, birds need four things, food, water, shelter, and places to rear, the young, rear their young. And you can provide all of these with your landscaping choices with what, what we call natural landscaping. So gardening for wildlife connects us to nature. Uh, but uh, too often we have a, uh, or m many people have a conception that our, bird, that our uh, landscapes need to look very orderly and neat and, uh, and they give little or no regard to whether anything is being offered to wildlife by those landscapes. So uh, the tradition of, uh, of an expansive lawn is one that started out in, uh, uh, with the aristocracy in England uh, back in four centuries ago. It was a status symbol to demonstrate to everyone that they, they were so rich they didn't need to grow food on their land, or not all of it at any rate, and they could have these large lawns that they would pay people to scythe and, and keep them nice and neat. Uh, well, uh, that standard is still with us, unfortunately, but lawns are, are a food desert. They are polluters and resource guzzlers as well. Uh, we use more synthetic pesticides on our lawns per acre than farmers do, far more. And we use a heck of a lot of water as well. Uh, part of the problem is that Kentucky bluegrass is a non-native grass and uh, it suffers uh, and it needs, it, um, it, it's on life support basically throughout the summer to keep it green. Uh, you might want to consider transitioning to turf type tall fescue, which has roots as deep as four feet. And so it needs a lot less or no, no fertilizer watering, less mowing, and it does fine in shade or sun. And, and speaking of challenging in, uh, places for, for, uh, for lawns, if you have a problem with shade or standing water or erosion, why not plant native perennials such as shrubs and trees that know just what to do in those situations? Uh, Mary Ann Borge uh, wrote a great article about this, uh, a wildlife family and pet friendly lawn. Uh, her uh, website, The Natural Web, is a trove of, of such articles and she's a, a quite talented photographer as well. I highly recommend thenaturalweb.org. So uh, environmental organizations are asking us to reduce our lawns by 25%. Uh, I think that's a realistic goal and one that we will find uh, uh, helps us to feel good about what we're doing with our landscapes and also uh, it brings us a lot of delight uh, and fascination just to, to see what's happening. Uh, brings us closer to nature. We learn so much about the plants and animals that are showing up uh, in uh, uh, on these kinds of landscapes. But many people have concerns about natural landscaping that need to be addressed and uh, one is uh, whether they attract vermin, which is not the case actually. Uh, and uh, Lyme disease ticks is certainly a concern, uh, but um, ticks cannot attach to you unless, uh, unless you brush against them. And so uh, if you have setbacks or paths for walking, uh, even if you have a, a wildflower meadow or, or tall vegetation, uh, as long as you're not touching that vegetation, the tick has no chance of uh, attaching itself to you. Uh, I invite you to check out LymeDisease.org, pre Preventing Ticks in Your Yard, for more information about ticks. Uh, you can also purchase tick repellents. Any of those four, these four um, ingredients are effective. Uh, and consider spraying your, if you're outside a lot, spraying your clothing and gear with permethrin 48 hours before you'll be outside. Uh, because it, does, it doesn't just repel, it actually kills ticks, mosquitoes, chiggers, mites, other insects but it's non-toxic to us and it lasts through six washings. Uh, or if you buy factory treated clothing, it lasts through 70 washings. 
And don't forget that there are animals out there that are effective tick predators. So natural landscaping will, will help them uh, do that job. Mosquitoes are actually more of a problem in lawns than natural landscaping because they're uh, more likely to be puddles in lawns. But uh, uh, if you do decide to have a water feature, which is great for wildlife, uh, be aware that uh, it's stagnant water that mosquito larvae need to become adult mosquitoes. And if you keep your water in motion with a solar activated pump, that will solve that problem. You can also stock your pond with koi goldfish or mosquito fish that will eat those larvae or you can add uh, the bacterium called BTI. This is, they're called mosquito bits or mosqui uh, mosquito dunks. Uh, and they're quite effective and they're harmless to the environment um, uh, at uh, quite effective at uh, killing mosquito larvae. Uh, allergenic pollen is a concern for some people, but it's really the non-native plants and grasses which you wouldn't want to be establishing in natural landscaping anyway. Uh, for example, ragweed, uh, public enemy number one, uh, and also other windborne plants and grasses uh, uh, are what you really need to, uh, what, uh, uh, what causes those uh, problems with people who suffer from allergies. Uh, and we all want our uh, uh, properties to at least uh, inc increase, if, uh, uh, keep, keep steady in value, if not increase, uh, but consider that uh, well-designed natural landscaping can actually enhance property values. In fact, it's been demonstrated that just a single tree can add thousands of dollars of value to your property. So uh, cert certainly uh, if your entire landscape uh, is enchanting uh, uh, both to wildlife and to you, well, uh, it'll find a buyer who agrees. Uh, massing one particular species in an area can be a, a dramatic way to uh, to make a, a landscape beautiful as well as wildlife friendly. Um, you want, you probably want to have uh, plants against the foundation and perhaps other features like the bird bath and the potted plant will make a landscape like this look uh, much more intentional than, uh, than uh, just you know, going wild. Uh, here's another planned uh, landscape, which is beautiful, but also lush and uh, full of uh, uh, plants that, uh, that are beneficial to wildlife. Uh, one thing you don't want on your landscape is invasive plants uh, and they, they can uh, just crowd out the, the ones that you want to, to uh, establish. So you're gonna want to learn about invasive plants, be able to recognize them and, and inventory your land to see if you have them and, and then make a, real, a realistic plan for either eliminating or controlling them and follow through with that plan. Japanese knotweed is a terrible nuisance. Uh, it's very difficult to get rid of. Uh, you can't uproot it because uh, there's no way to get all of the root out of the soil and then every piece of root will send up an another sprout. Uh, what I'm doing on the, I, li I live in a condo and I've decided to use uh, black plastic and smother the entire area uh, until uh, the, the roots have simply exhausted their energy and cannot, can no longer uh, uh, re-sprout. Uh, oriental bittersweet is a terrible nuisance as well. This vine can actually kill trees by girdling them. Uh, so if you have any of this vine that's reached the canopy, uh, please uh, lop it off at the base so it, at least the, that vine cannot continue to make flowers and, and seeds that are tempting for birds. Uh, autumn olive and uh, multiflora rose are two shrubs that have made themselves far too welcome here in our environment and displaced a lot of our native plants, bush honeysuckles as well. Uh, and burning bush is not allowed to be sold by nurseries these days. Goutweed, garlic mustard, black swallowwort. There are 31 different uh, invasive species that are described in this article by Mass, offered by masslive.com that you can learn about uh, how to recognize them and how to deal with them. Uh, consider that uh, Native fruits really are much more nutritious for birds. And a, a, a study in Hingham proved that uh, birds uh, preferred blueberries, black cherries, and black raspberries, for example, to the invasive fruits, Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, multiflora rose, for example, that might have been far more abundant, but just didn't have the nutrition that those birds needed when they were migrating. 
poison ivy, incidentally, is, is a native vine and it belongs here in our, um, uh, in our landscapes. Uh, those fruits uh, can be eaten by birds as a winter food source, but uh, you certainly might decide to uh, control poison ivy anywhere on your property where people might come in contact with it. And uh, so if there's any area uh, that you'd like to transition, whether it's a, a patch of poison ivy or a, a lawn or weeds or what have you, uh, no need to dig. Why not just uh, smother the area with either cardboard or newspaper? And uh, you need to overlap the pieces of cardboard that you should not use shiny cardboard. You'll need to get the staples and tape off. Uh, if you use newspaper, six thicknesses are necessary. Um, if you're starting a, a vegetable garden, then you probably want some compost on top of that. But for, uh, uh, for uh, pollinator gardens, generally those plants are not so needy in terms of fertility. And in fact, uh, you might be giving weeds the edge uh, if you have a lot of compost and enrich the soil because they do need that uh, fertility. Uh, and then uh, whether you're growing vegetables or uh, wildflowers, the top uh, layer is mulch, which is why it's called sheet mulching. Uh, incidentally, the, you'll see this photo in the lower right. This product is uh, it's called Builder's Paper and they're different brands that you can purchase. Uh, they're used by painters to roll out on the floor so that they won't make a mess of the of the floor when they're painting, but you can use it as your barrier layer when you're sheet mulching if there's a large expanse that you want to transition uh, to from, from lawn or other vegetation. Uh, and the mulch itself uh, is important not only to cover that barrier layer and keep it in place, but also it suppresses the weeds, keeps the soil moist and cool, and enriches the soil. Uh, so if you're doing an annual vegetable bed, for example, or, or annual uh, flowers, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, and pine straw or pine needles are all uh, acceptable. Uh, but for perennial beds, um, shredded leaves are fine, but they'll decompose fairly quickly. Pine straw, on the other hand, is an excellent um, mulch because it does not uh, decompose uh, very fast and also uh, it does not uh, turn the soil acidic as many people have been led to believe. Pine bark, sawdust, wood chips, chip branch wood are also all options. Please don't use dyed mulch. It's often contaminated with creosote and CCA which is bad for the plants. Uh, also please don't uh, d uh, mulch your trees with a mound of, of mulch because that uh, will encourage roots to grow where they shouldn't and um, and as that uh, mulch degrades, uh, you'll see that those roots will become exposed. A and think about mulch as a temporary expediency to keep the weeds out, to keep the soil moist and cool, but eventually the plants themselves will perform those functions. This is a rain garden and so water is being funneled right from the roof into this, air into this bed um, and you'll see how happy the, the plants are with this arrangement and they're just filling that space and there's, there's really no need to mulch this area uh, once the plants are, are so well established. And this is, the, uh, this is really the kind of landscaping that you want to aim for. A lot of plants uh, is good for wildlife and it's also in the end uh, less work for you in terms of weeding and mulching and all that. Ground covers are an effective way uh, to keep uh, weeds out and uh, and also to uh, retain moisture and keep the soil cool. In addition, they'll hold the soil in place on slopes. Uh, so I mentioned bearberry as one of my favorite ground covers. There's also thyme. Uh, bees uh, get thyme oil from these flowers, which helps them combat diseases that are uh, transmitted by varroa mites. Uh, Three-leaved sink foil is a beautiful evergreen uh, ground, uh, ground cover. And some of those leaves turn color in, in the fall as well. Uh, golden star, those cheerful yellow flowers. Um, wild ginger, which can grow in dense shade. It, it might take a while to establish itself, but once it does, it's quite functional uh, as a ground cover in, ex in excluding weeds. Bishop's hat is another enchanting ground cover and is shade tolerant as well. So is Allegheny Pacassandra, our native version of the Japanese Pacassandra that is so ubiquitous and is also fairly invasive for that matter. So I prefer the uh, our native Pacassandra 
and I, I think it's more attractive as well. And then there's barren strawberry, which blooms in the spring, does a great job of keep, keeping everything else out. And wild strawberry, perhaps not as effective as a ground cover, but it's a wonderful for um, a variety of uh, uh, wildlife, and, and term, and including uh, caterpillars that will eat some of the foliage. Uh, now, uh, hummingbirds are also considered beneficial because they are both predators and pollinators. They are expert hunters. They, they eat a wide variety of insects. They can uh, hawk uh, insects on the fly or find them in various places. Uh, Ruby-throated hummingbird is the only one that we're likely to see here in New England. And uh, populations of the ruby throat have actually doubled in the last half century. Uh, so we don't need to be concerned about their, um, their numbers. However, people love them so much that it's, it, it's uh, uh, great to attract them to our properties, provide moving water because they love that, snags for perches to give them a chance to rest. Uh, and uh, it's, it's fascinating how yellow-bellied sap, sap suckers will make these holes and then um, hummingbirds help themselves to the sap and to the insects that are drawn to the sap. They also might help the sap suckers because they actually chase away the other birds um, that would otherwise be helping themselves to the, that sap sucker uh, sap from those holes. Uh, hummingbirds need spider silk for their webs. Uh, and because they use spider silk, which is so elastic, the web, uh, excuse me, the, the nest, their nest will expand uh, to double its original size as those chicks uh, grow. Very unusual arrangement for a, a bird nest. Uh, it's okay to rescue a hummingbird chick if you find one on the ground. In fact, any chick of, of, of any bird uh, uh, can um, it's, it's, it's actually a myth that, uh, that the adult will reject the chick because it has a human scent. But don't hang around nests and watch the birds because that can attract predators to them. Uh, if you want to feed hummingbirds with a hummingbird feeder, this is a good design because those two halves, uh, just uh, the two bowl-shaped halves can be easily detached by unscrewing them and then uh, easily cleaned and then uh, uh, re, uh, repositioned and uh, you're, you're back, you're good to go. Uh, you, want to, uh, you want a four to one ratio of water to sugar. Don't use any food coloring. Uh, there's enough red color on the feeder itself to attract the hummingbirds. Uh, you know, so you would heat to dissolve that uh, sugar water and refrigerate it and use it within one week. Replace your food every few days in the feeder and clean that feeder every three days. In order to do that, you're gonna use hot tap, tap water and scrub the sides, but do not use soap because soap residue is harmful to hummingbirds. And black mold is another uh, 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 issue that can, can uh, pop up. So uh, if you get black mold, you're gonna to have to use a dilute a solution of bleach, a one to 64 ratio, soak it for one hour. Uh, and on hot days, that nectar can spoil. It, it can become cloudy and you'll have to replace it. In fact, that can happen in just one day. I hope I've impressed on you how important it is to be vigilant if you do offer hummingbirds sugar water. Again, uh, we don't want to harm when we're trying to help. Um, in fact, I would much rather offer hummingbirds uh, such uh, wonderful uh, flowers as, the, uh, as far as they're concerned, the trumpet creeper, just the abundance of flowers that have just the right balance of the different kinds of sugars. They also have trace amounts of min minerals, proteins, and amino acids. Do not plant a trumpet creeper vine near your uh, dwelling because they can uh, cause some damage to, uh, uh, to your house, but uh, uh, to the fixtures of your house. But uh, if you have a place on your landscape uh, that, that can support vines, by all means, go for it. Here's another vine popular with hummingbirds, trumpet honeysuckle. Uh, cardinal flower, because hummingbirds love the color red. Uh, this is a sensationally beautiful plant. It can, it can do quite well in, in wet places. It does not want to dry out, um, although you can grow it in normal soil. Uh, wild columbine, a spring blooming flower, it's a native, and that uh, when hummingbirds have arrived from their migration, they can use that as a food source. Uh, butterfly weed uh, is another one popular with hummingbirds. So as you can see, uh, they don't restrict themselves to red 
uh, colored flowers. Anis hyssop is another one. Obedient plant, blazing star, swamp milkweed, foxglove beard tongue, purple cone flower, and any of the phlox species. So uh, on with the show. Bats are also beneficial because they are predators. They eat nothing but insects. A little brown bat and big brown bat are the two that you're most likely to see in New England, the most common. Uh, little brown bat's population has uh, plummeted by 90% due to the uh, uh, infestations of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's called a, a fungus that causes white nose syndrome. Um, so we can offer uh, clean uh, boxes that are free of that uh, fungus, um, either purchase or make them install them on the south uh, of your house, preferably underneath the eaves. And one of those boxes will house a number of different, uh, you know, just a large quantity. It's amazing how many bats will fit inside there. Um, you are not allowed to evict bats in the middle of summer because they are uh, caring for their pups at that time. Uh, Mass.gov will explain uh, how to evict bats safely and humanely. Uh, leave dead trees standing. Don't use pesticides. Keep your cats indoors because a cat can decimate a roost, uh, roosting population of bats if, if it finds where that uh, where they are. Uh, minimize uh, artificial lighting on your property because that's dis uh, disturbing and disrupting to bats. And now the butterflies and moths, which together are called lepidopterans, are also beneficials because they are pollinators and they're certainly one of the most popular insects out there. There are actually 20 times as many moths as butterflies, incidentally, and moths are usually active at night, butterflies in the day. Moths also have feather-like antennae compared to the butterflies' antennae, which are club-tipped. Uh, and butterflies make chrysalises, moths spin cocoons. Uh, population of butterflies in Ohio dropped by 33% in just two decades, and, and habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change are likely the, uh, the factors causing that decline. And uh, in fact, all flying insects and insects in general uh, have been observed to be uh, plummeting in, in numbers, which has led some people to refer to it as an insect apocalypse or bug apocalypse. Um, this study in Germany, where they had been um, trapping and, and weighing flying insects for 27 years, uh, in that period of time, a 75% drop uh, in the flying, in the biomass of those insects was, uh, was measured. And figures like that have been, uh, have been seen all over the world. So uh, we really need to, to realize how important insects are to us and to the rest of wildlife. Without them, we would have a flowerless world with, because no pollinators, uh, silent forests because birds need them. Uh, and insects also are important decomposers, and they are the base of the food chain. So uh, uh, insects are, are, are a vital part of our ecosystem. Uh, and if we off, if we uh, practice uh, butterfly gardening and, and uh, take take that up as an interest, we're bound to be helping insects in general because other pollinators will visit as well. Butterfly gardening uh, uh, is, is best to have. Uh, full sun, which is considered uh, at least six hours. Uh, it's helpful to be near a water source and to have some shelter from the wind. Uh, absolutely necessary to have host plants because unless you have caterpillars, you're not gonna have the adult butterflies. Nectar producing plants should be offered throughout the growing season uh, and organic landscaping practices are also important. But don't bother putting out a butterfly box because no one has ever found a butterfly inside a butterfly box. Uh, spiders and wasps have been found, but no butterflies. Uh, mud, however, is something that you can offer butterflies. The males uh, will sip the mud and get the minerals in the mud uh, and use them to make pheromones, which are a chemical that attracts the females to them. And when they mate with the females, they pass those minerals to her and uh, then uh, those minerals are used uh, to make their, uh, uh, to contribute to the health of the eggs. So in order to uh, give a male butterflies mud, you could repurpose uh, a bird bath or put a saucer in the ground that has uh, gravel or sand. And then for the minerals, you would add salt or compost. And then you would keep that moist and make sure that uh, 
or one way to keep uh, keep something moist is to have it uh, uh, is, is is for water to be that draining from a drain spout to lead to that uh, mud puddle. Uh, give them fruit. Uh, butterflies, it's amazing how they'll eat fruit, not only uh, fresh, but on, well on its way to, to rotting. They'll, they'll still eat it. Um, and give them host plants. And the uh, National Wild, Wildlife Federation uh, has studied which ones are the most valuable. Goldenrod, far and away, is the uh, best uh, uh, herbaceous plant. Uh, host for 125 different species and strawberry, sunflower, and bird's foot trefoil were also found to be valuable. Then there's a long list of other plants that are natives. But uh, when it comes to host plants, there's nothing that beats trees such as the oak, uh, members of the prunus genus like beech plum, cherry, and choke cherry, willows, uh, birches, all of them are host plants for hundreds of larvae and there's far uh, many other trees that are valuable as well uh, for this purpose. Uh, some butterflies are very specific. The female a spice bush swallowtail butterfly must lay her eggs on either the spice bush or the sassafras uh, tree. Uh, no other leaf will do because the, the larvae can't eat any other kind of leaf. Incidentally, those eyes on the side of their bodies are fake. Uh, they're painted on it as it were, uh, but they don't see out of them. They're just uh, decorations that uh, make them look more uh, intimidating to a, a would-be predator. Black swallowtail uh, larvae uh, caterpillars will eat the leaves of dill, parsley, fennel, uh, carrots, queen anne's lace, other members of the Apiaceae family. Um, and then there's Baltimore checker spot. Host, plant, host plants include turtle head and the very common uh, broad-leafed or narrow-leafed plantain that are that appear in people's lawns. Uh, and host plants for the spring azure include New Jersey, New Jersey tea, viburnums, meadowsweet, and dogwoods. Great spangled fritillary uh, caterpillars can eat violet leaves, or, and that's true of other fritillaries as well. The common blue violet that's that's uh, fairly ubiquitous on uh, on lawns. And then there's the monarch butterfly, the one that everyone knows about and uh, uh, just they're so inspiring, they're, the long migrations that they're capable of. Uh, and most people are aware that caterpillars, uh, monarch caterpillars can only eat milkweed leaves. And this is the common milkweed, which uh, will be found in fields in abundance at times. Uh, but I don't suggest that you plant common milkweed in your, in your pollinator garden because it's not, uh, it's, it's not going to be, stay where you put it. It's just gonna travel all over uh, and pop up anywhere and it'll be very difficult to get rid of. So it's, a, it, it's just too aggressive for a pollinator garden. You're better off planting either swamp milkweed or butterfly weed in a sunny garden and poke milkweed in a shady garden. Uh, and if your garden tends to be wet, use swamp milkweed. If it tends to be dry, butterfly weed is the better choice. choice. But uh, normal soils will support both swamp and butterfly weed. Monarch Watch has measured uh, monarch populations over the years, and uh, they have declined dramatically, especially in the Western population, but also here in the East. Main, the main reason is uh, the glyphosate that's sprayed on crops which has killed so many of the milkweed plants that monarchs depend on. Uh, so you can create a monarch waste station and you can order one of these signs that proudly proclaims that you're helping monarchs from monarchwatch.org. Uh, and here is an example of a, a monarch uh, waste station. And of course it's beneficial not just to monarchs but other butterflies and pollinators as well. Uh, there are 12 species here, two of them are um, grasses. So grasses are also valuable. Uh, to provide habitat for uh, for insects, especially for ground-dwelling bees. Notice how the, uh, the plants are grouped in clusters so that it's easier for pollinators to go from one to the next uh, when that flower is in bloom. Sharon Stichter created a list of her top 15 butterfly plants about a decade ago and it was published uh, by the North American Butterfly Association, NABA.org. And she included butterfly bush, uh, really her first choice. Uh, and it's quite popular with many uh, 
folks who uh, who are wanting to lure butterflies because it, it certainly is uh, attractive to them. However, uh, they uh, these plants can be uh, uh, ne not necessarily uh, hardy in uh, New England. Sometimes they perish in a, in a severe uh, winter, and they also uh, are, are non-native and they're not a, a host plant for any moth or butterfly species. And on top of that, it appears that the butterfly bush is currently invasive in Massachusetts and will be more so most likely as the climate changes. So it's preferable to plant native, uh, natives such as New Jersey tea, which is a fairly short shrub, uh, sweet pepper bush, compass plant, uh, which is a tall perennial that uh, it's called cup plant as well because the uh, the leaves uh, create a basin for water to uh, uh, to hold rainwater that uh, then birds and insects can then drink from blazing star a beautiful uh, native wildflower thistle is attractive to butterflies so are all the asters P purple coneflower scabiosa Joe pie weed, which is a tall perennial that grows in wet places, but also in normal soil. Uh, the same can be said of bone set. And the milkweeds are also quite popular with butterflies of all, all species, not just the monarchs, uh, and a lot of other pollinators as well. Here are some annuals that were included in this list. Zinnia, Mexican sunflower, and marigolds. None of these are native plants, but they are popular with uh, butterflies. Uh, and you might want to be aware of which plants uh, deer are likely to consume. Uh, I know that they like New England aster, for, exa aster, for example, and I, they, they routinely uh, uh, eat off the tops of my New England aster. Uh, here are a couple of um, sources of information about deer resistant native plants. Uh, you might also want to be aware of plants that groundhogs and rabbits won't eat if you have uh if you know that you have them in your neighborhood uh if you don't have a lot of space for a garden you might consider container gardening the larger the container the better because it uh, you won't need to water it as often and you can have more plants in a large container and think about the strip of land between your sidewalk and your street you could call it a heaven strip instead of a hell strip uh, if you've got uh, pollinator plants there Susanna Lerman uh, did an experiment where uh, she had uh, her um, she she had some folks uh, mowing every week and some folks mowing every other week, and not surprisingly, lawns mowed every other week allowed many more flowers to bloom, and so as many as 111 different native bee species were detected on those wild wildflower lawns. It's also possible to be proactive and actually seed in um, plants into your lawn that will uh, attract pollinators. Uh, here's some more that uh, you might, in fact, back in the day, uh, white clover seed was included in seed mixes. Uh, that was before people somehow got into their heads that uh, they wanted a, a perfectly manicured lawn that looked like a carpet. Um, and why not consider a wildflower meadow? such a gorgeous uh, vista uh, to look out on and uh, very valuable for pollinators. Uh, you need about 400 square feet for a meadow, which isn't all that large, uh, or it could be much larger, of course. Uh, I highly recommend uh, really researching how to do it and how to do it right and getting expert advice uh, from uh, either a landscaper or a company that sells the seed. Uh, extension.unh.edu is a great resource for learning about how to, uh, well, the first thing you need to do is completely eradicate the existing uh, vegetation. And that'll take a whole year to do, uh, either by covering it with a tarp and smothering it or um, repeated tilling or using uh, herbicides. All of those will be effective uh, eventually. But uh, if, if you haven't done that step well, then you're going to have a lot of problems down the line with, with other weeds popping up. Uh, but consider that, F, that it's, it can be worth an investment of uh, eliminating vegetation and buying that seed because uh, after, it's, uh, after you have that meadow, 
uh, you're only mowing once a week, uh, or excuse me, once a year in the spring, uh, and you'll have no other uh, amendments or irrigation to worry about either. Now bees are uh, wonderfully uh, beneficial because they are the best pollinators out there. The reason for this is they have fuzzy bodies that uh, carry a lot of pollen. And the honeybee uh, did, uh, was not found on North American continent and, until uh, Euro Europeans brought it over here on, intentionally about four centuries ago. So it's a non-native bee and it's probably the most common bee out there. Certainly the one that most people are the uh, people are the most familiar with, but there are many uh, native bees, at least 400 um, right here in Massachusetts. Uh, and they include bumblebees and many others. Uh, it's certainly true that honeybees make honey and pollinate crop, crops, which makes them very valuable to us. But in, in terms of the, in the, the environment, they're not valuable at all. If, if they became extinct, uh, we would have, uh, the, the plants uh, would simply rely on the native pollinators. Uh, bees and wasps are different, by the way. Some people are in the habit of, of, habit of calling yellow jackets a bee, but they're not, they're a wasp. Uh, and you're more likely to be stung by wasps such as yellow jackets than you are by bees. Uh, bumblebees, uh, are, as I mentioned, are native uh, and there are several species. Uh, they, uh, they carry uh, pollen baskets on their hind legs just like honeybees do uh, because there's a lot of protein in pollen. This is a female bumblebee starting a colony in which she, uh, she has to start that colony from scratch right at the beginning of the spring, which means she'll, she'll need a lot of uh, pollen and nectar uh, to keep herself alive and also to be raising her brood. Uh, and this is what a colony looks like uh, when there might be uh, eventually hundreds of bumblebees in a colony, but that's a lot less than the thousands of honeybees that you'll find in a ho honeybee colony. One thing that bumblebees are great at is, as, is bu buzz pollination. This is a tomato flower and uh, the pollen is in, inside the an anther rather than outside, which is the case for most flowers. So the bumblebee knows just what to do. It, it can vibrate uh, the, those, those stamens with its thoracic muscles at just the right frequency so that the pollen comes tumbling out onto its, uh, uh, onto its body. And uh, so tomato growers uh, keep uh, bumblebee boxes for, uh, to uh, let them uh, have their broods right there in their greenhouses. Raspberries, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and cucumbers are other bumblebee pollinated crops. Uh, and there are wildflowers that are exclusively pollinated by bumblebees, such as this turtle head. It can be quite comical to, to watch a bumblebee inside a flower uh, that you can't see the, the bumblebee, but uh, you'll see the flower moving. It's almost like the flower is swallowing the bee. Uh, but uh, the nectar must be well worth the effort because uh, the, the bumblebee is, is quite likely to, to fly off and search for another turtle head uh, flower, which is uh, creating brand loyalty. Uh, if you think about it, the turtle head plant, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the, the flowers are more likely to be pollinated if the, that particular pollinator uh, is uh, devoting itself to finding more flowers just like it. Here's another uh, bumblebee pollinated flower. It never opens. It's called the bottle gentian and only the bumblebee can force its way inside and get that nectar. Uh, Rusty patched bumblebees are gone from Massachusetts and endangered elsewhere. Uh, they used to be quite common. American bumblebee is, has also become endangered um, or threatened. And the, the, uh, there are some bumblebees that are significantly more common, such as the two-spotted bumblebee uh, and the eastern uh, bumblebee. So um, the... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but many other bumblebees have uh, declined dramatically or are simply gone. Um, and that's most likely due to climate change and loss of habitat, but also pests uh, and pathogens play a, a, a role in limiting their populations. Pesticides, poor nutrition as well, pollution because uh, pollinators can't smell flowers as easily when there's pollution in the air, and plants that are non-natives and invasives also are displacing uh, bumblebees and making it harder for them to find their food. One problem with the pesticides is that 
it's not just the active ingredients, but the inert ingredients, which are secret, and therefore we don't uh, know uh, what's in them, uh, and it's hard, it's hard to uh, study them. But uh, this recent study in Britain demonstrated that uh, even the product Roundup with, without glyphosate uh, had a very high mortality rate, so it must have been due to the inert ingredients, or supposedly inert ingredients. Um, for bumblebee uh, habitat, leave abandoned mouse and bird nests because they can create their colonies in them. Uh, leave it be landscaping in general is beneficial to wildlife. But I, I would comment that uh, you're, you're not gonna get um, uh, a wildlife sanctuary simply by, uh, by mowing no longer and just leave, leave it letting things go wild. What you're much more likely to get is a tangle of invasive plants and vines and uh, things that you don't want in a, and are not that beneficial for wildlife. So uh, landscaping, natural landscaping really is uh, something to, that, that requires some thoughtful planning. Uh, bumblebee nesting boxes are a possibility uh, for uh, helping bumblebees out, you're, although your chances are probably not much better than one out of five that you'll actually be successful in luring a female to use that uh, box. Uh, there are some uh, insects that mimic butter bumblebees because that gives them an advantage of uh, uh, looking ferocious. Uh, and then there are these uh, small and beautiful uh, ground-dwelling sweat bees. They're called that because they're attracted to our perspiration, but they uh, are not harmful at all. Uh, and uh, they're, they are generalists. They're able to eat the, the pollen of many different flowers. Here's another ground dwelling bee that has a remarkable, the female has the remarkable, remarkable ability to line her nest with something that serves as a plastic barrier. It's like, it's like, it's like a plastic bag inside that uh, ground uh, uh, cavity in the ground. And uh, she provisions it with the uh, uh, combination of pollen and nectar, uh, lays her egg inside that plastic bag and seals it up and then uh, that egg grows to maturity and uh, emerges in the spring. Uh, you can offer habitat for ground nesting bees by uh, uh, providing an area devoid of vegetation that's several yards across with loose, well-drained soil, uh, flat areas or earthen banks that's su also sunny and south facing, or you can use soil filled planters as well uh, and a, a, a mixture of uh, sand and gravel and soil. Uh, stay off the, these areas so that you won't be disturbing the, the bees. Uh, keep in mind also that grasses can offer habitat because uh, they're effectively keeping the, the, uh, the ground underneath them free of other vegetation and, and so that ground is bare and uh, bees can use it uh, to uh, tunnel, uh, tunnel down into the ground. Um, uh, a blue orchard mason bee. It is called a mason bee because it's uh, it, it um, was called an orchard bee because it's the most efficient bee uh, for pollinating uh, those orchard uh, those flowers of fruit trees. A honey bee, honey bee is most likely just going to visit the flower and then uh, go from flower to flower to flower on that same tree, which doesn't do any good for that tree until it finally go visits a different tree. Blue orchard mason bees are much likely to visit a flower and then travel to the next uh, tree. So they're uh, much more efficient pollinators. They also are called mason bees because they partition their chambers with mud. Uh, and uh, actually this, this photo shows bamboo being used, but, but I've learned that bamboo is not a desirable material for, uh, for, for mason bees to uh, uh, for their cavity nesting because it doesn't breathe very well. Um, leaf cutter bees are remarkably, uh, they also are also cavity nesters and they, uh, they line their chambers with these neatly cut circles uh, that they can then roll up and insert into the cavity. Uh, and they are pollinators of blueberry, onion, carrot, and alfalfa. Uh, in my pollinator garden, I have tick trefoil and I was delighted last year to see some uh, of those leaves with those perfectly cut circles on the margins. And I was so proud to know that I was helping those leaf cutter bees. Um, some owners of uh, rose plants, for example, in this lower right hand corner, 
those are rose leaves. It might be somewhat dismayed to see those circles cut out, but not to worry that the roses are still perfectly healthy because there's plenty of leaf area uh, accomplishing the uh, photosynthesis needed to keep that plant going. Someone drilled three holes in uh, a block of wood here and uh, leaf cutter bees used the top one. You can see at least a half dozen uh, leaf uh, chambers uh, surrounded by those uh, leaf sections. Uh, a rosin bee used, used rosin to partition, partition its chambers, and you can see the uh, larvae there, and then the cocoons of the mason bee with uh, mud uh, creating the separate compartments. And there are many uh, plants that you can use for cavity nesting bees. This is a, just a partial list. Um, Uh, Japanese knotweed is one of them, incidentally, and uh, I mentioned Japanese knotweed as being a pernicious uh, invasive plant, but uh, its stalks are good for uh, mason bee hotels or other cavity nesting bees. Uh, you're going to want uh, stems that are 3 32nd inches to 3 8 inches wide and uh, variable depth depending on how wide they are. Uh, and uh, you, you notice that uh, someone is rolling a piece of paper around a dowel or a pencil, that piece of paper will then, then be inserted in, into one of these uh, sections of stem so that in the, uh, in the fall that can be removed and uh, the uh, diseased mason bees would then be uh, discarded and the healthy ones uh, protected uh, over uh, for the entire winter in your refrigerator and then released in a, in a release box in the spring. Uh, so here are some of the best plant, uh, best flowers for attracting native bees. Uh, first place, wild bergamot, 15 different genera of native bees uh, will visit this uh, mint plant, which is uh, similar to, in appearance to uh, bee balm, which has uh, bright red flowers, but otherwise uh, looks quite similar. Uh, so wild, ber wild bergamot makes it to everyone's uh, list of top pollinator plants. Black-eyed Susan is also quite valuable. So is bone set. So are these uh, milkweeds, which I've mentioned, swamp milkweed and butterfly weed, also uh, tick seed, oxeye sunflower, mountain mint, and blue ver ver vervain. Uh, a word about mountain mint, mint one of my favorite uh, pollinator plants. Uh, so many different kinds of pollinators vis visit this plant. The flowers aren't particularly showy, uh, but uh, they have something that insects love because it's a real lesson in entomology to watch all the insects that come uh, visit this plant. Uh, and uh, uh, the great black wasp, for example, on the right, and, which is really harmless, uh, tachnid fly, which is a beneficial organism, and, and the bumblebee all shown, but there are many others. Uh, one advantage of uh, the mountain mint is that if you take some leaves, crush them, and then apply those leaves to your skin, it's an effective mosquito repellent. Uh, Fox club beard tongue, cup plant, New England aster, golden alexanders, all valuable native bee magnets. So are big leaf aster, wild geranium, yellow coneflower, Anasysa purple coneflower, Jacob's ladder, Ohio spiderwort, uh, ironweed, a very tall perennial, culver's root can grow in the shade, uh, and then harebell, wild lupin, and bloodroot uh, round out the list of plants that attract at least seven native bee genera. Uh, but a word to the wise, cultivars are uh, might uh, be uh, pretty to us, but uh, relatively worthless or even totally worthless uh, to, to pollinators. Uh, so this is the original species of, of purple coneflower, upper left. Uh, anytime you see uh, single quote quotation marks around a name, that's a cultivar. Uh, so this is called green jewel. Uh, in this case, there, there's no pollen or nectar anywhere in that flower to be had. And even, uh, even this one that uh, um, re resembles superficially the purple coneflower, uh, it just uh, is, is inferior in quantity and, and uh, quality of uh, nectar. So the problems with cultivars are that there might be less nutrition for pollinators. There's less genetic vari variation among them because they've been inbred. So they're more vulnerable to pests and diseases. They may not even be open-pollinated open or, or self-seed. 
uh, and they're less adapted to local soils and climate, so they can be hard to keep, keep alive in some cases. Uh, they may distract pollinators from visiting wild plants, and the wild plants need all the pollinators and all the help they can get. Uh, they might also hybridize with native species, which we don't want to ha happen with, because that will affect the survive survivability of the native species of plants. So here is, here is a list of plants that have either very low or no value to pollinators. The pansy, the daylily, hybrid tea rose, uh, double marigold, petunia, New Guinea impatiens, begonia, peony, and forsythia. Uh, there are others that uh, would fall in these categories, but notice these are na non-native plants, and sometimes they just have too many petals, and they've been bred for attractiveness to people, not for their use usefulness to wildlife. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the three Ps, pollinators, predators, and parasites. So let's give some attention to those predators and parasites that limit the populations of pest insects. Uh, spiders and praying mantises are both generalists and eat whatever they can find. Uh, but really the most valuable uh, predators are the ones that uh, are uh, controlling pest populations in particular, and the, the larvae of lacewings uh, are in that category. Uh, and notice how the adult is a pollinator. You can offer a lacewing hotel uh, by cutting the base of a plastic bottle and inserting a rolled up piece of cardboard and then hanging that from a branch. <laughs> Ladybug beetles. Uh, are also uh, beneficial predators. It's the, again, it's the larvae that goes after the aphids, mites, and mutabugs. And again, the adults are pollinators. Uh, ladybug hotels can be offered with a, a mesh bag full of pine cones. Fireflies are beneficial because they prey on insect larvae, snails, and slugs. You can offer them low-hanging trees, forest litter, long grasses, ponds, and streams. Don't use synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. And please turn off your outdoor lights because it uh, it confuses and distracts them from their mating. Uh, assassin bugs are valuable predators as are hoverfly and surfeit fly. Again, notice how the adult is a, a pollinator. Trichogramma wasps are parasites because they lay their eggs. These tiny wasps lay their eggs uh, in the eggs of much larger species of insects, and yet they, are, they effectively kill those eggs and uh, the trichogramma wasp uh, then can develop inside that egg. And then there are the bracketed wasps, which are, uh, there's just a huge number, a uh, huge diversity of different kinds of wasps that uh, focus, uh, that parasitize uh, uh, different types of insects uh, and keep their uh, populations under control. Um, so in order to attract these beneficial predators and parasites, again, it's the pollinator plants that do it. Uh, members of the APACA, Queen Anne's lace, dill, uh, wild uh, and a regular carrot, uh, fennel, uh, goldenrod and tansy, marigold and dandelion are members of the aster family that bring them in. Also boneset, yarrow, coreopsis, aster. Uh, th these are only partial lists. And members of the mint family, lemiaceae, horse mint is, is a, a magnet for wasp species and it's a, a chanting flower. Uh, bugleweed is a common, uh, flower found in, in many people's lawns. And uh, wild berg, bergamot again and anise hyssop just keep, keep popping up on people's favorite lists of uh, pollinator plants. So natural control of garden pests is called IPM, integrated pest management. We could also call it intelligent pest management because we certainly don't want to be harming the very uh, beneficial insects uh, that are helping control these pests by using uh, toxic chemicals that are uh, systemic and, and, uh, and are attacking anything that flies. So a um, uh, preferable strategy might be just uh, floating row covers, for example, as a barrier. Uh, companion plants, which might uh, repel those pests. Hand picking can sometimes be feasible. Organic pesticides are uh, in most cases pre vastly preferable to the synthetic. Uh, now we are, we're used to thinking of uh, herbaceous perennials like wildflowers as being the best perennial, the best pollinator plants, but trees and shrubs offer a vast quantity of uh, blooms when they're, when they're in bloom. And willow is in bloom in the early spring and is, and is probably one of the most important pollinator plants out there. A, a, a wonderful assortment of different insects will visit willow, uh, willow trees in the spring when they're in bloom. Uh, there's uh, 
there are witch hazels that bloom in the spring and one and, and or in the fall. Uh, redbud, a sensationally ornamental tree uh, that blooms in the spring. Uh, fruit trees are also attractive to pollinators. Uh, the American plum is a native plum. Uh, beach plum is a, a, a native uh, shrub with, with plums uh, that are edible, but also a pollinator plant. And once again, black cherry and choke cherry, not just for birds, but also for the bees and other insects. Virginia rose and Carolina rose are native roses. And Rigosa rose is also valuable. And then Juneberry, one of my favorite uh, trees out there. Uh, Maples and oaks uh, have small flowers that are not showy, but they are valuable as uh, sources of pollen and nectar. Basswood is very popular with bees. Uh, the blueberries, especially with bumblebees. Red ocean dogwood is a good pollinator plant. So is nine bark. But notice how that uh, cultivar with the dark leaves uh, does not support, uh, uh, is not a host plant. For example, the nine bark leaf beetle can't eat those purple leaves. And there's so many purple leaf varieties of shrubs and trees out there, uh, but we should really be cautious about establishing them on our property because they, in many cases, um, are, are not um, providing nourishment to the, ho to the caterpillars um, that we should be supporting. Uh, winterberry holly, holly is another one for both birds and bees. Uh, staghorn sumac also, uh, look at those bees swarming over that inflorescence on the left. Uh, the viburnums and the native hydrangeas, panicle or smooth hydrangea. And mountain laurel that uh, can tolerate uh, fairly dense shade and is quite attractive to pollinators. Think about spring ephemerals that are able to bloom before the uh, trees leaf out and, uh, and before the trees are shading them. So snowdrops uh, in, in the early spring, crocuses, grape hyacinth, Siberian squill, wild bleeding heart, and bloodroot are all examples of spring, spring ephemerals for pollinators. Uh, annuals are valuable as well. The sunflower, Mexican sunflower, zinnia, spider flower, Ageratum, sweet alyssum, borage, pineapple sage, cosmos bipinatus. Uh, um, not many of these are native, but they, they are attractive to, uh, to pollinators for sure. And consider also that when you're growing culinary herbs and allow them to blossom, uh, basil, chives, rosemary, oregano, lavender, and catmint, those are also beneficial to pollinators. Uh, Kathy Neal has done a wonderful service in creating this flowering calendar for native pollinator plants. You want to have at least uh, three plants in bloom at all times, and you want to have several individual, uh, 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 several individuals of that species, uh, of each species. So uh, this, a, a calendar like this shows how long, uh, when and how long those different flowers are in bloom. And uh, the uh, same website, uh, UNH Extension, um, in this case, Pollinator Plants for Northern New England, is where you would find this chart. But again, uh, this information will come to you uh, in your email inbox uh, um, as soon as I pass it on to the library. Um, now, the, the uh, most economical way to grow a lot of plants and a lot of different species is certainly buying seeds and growing, them, growing those seeds. Uh, many seeds need cold treatment f first, though, because uh, they don't uh, they don't want to be tricked into thinking that it's uh, spring uh, and uh, and germinating in the fall and then being killed by the winter. So many seeds have uh, dor dormancy that that needs to be broken by a prolonged period of moisture and cool temperatures in between 34 and 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Freezing temperatures do not accomplish this. Uh, so our refrigerators are ideal uh, climates uh, right in, the, in that range of 34 to 41 degrees. And you can uh, put seeds of uh, different species in plastic bags uh, and keep them moist with either vermiculite, sand, or paper towels. Uh, I highly recommend Wild Seed Project, a, pl a place in Maine where you can buy the seeds from them and you'll also learn a lot about growing natives from seeds. And these other to uh, resources are also valuable. Now, uh, when you grow them, uh, when, when you plant those seeds, uh, it's, it's fine to have them fairly crowded at first. Uh, they seem to like company, uh, but eventually you will want to give them their own 
separate cells. These are called plugs. Um, and uh, you can buy plugs for that matter. And they certainly are less expensive in general than potted plants, which are larger. However, you often uh, need to, to buy an entire flat of a particular species so that those flats can be expensive. But in any, in any event, if you're, if you're growing these plants from seed yourself, uh, or if you buy flats, you're assured that every individual uh, is genetically unique and that diversity is important uh, for the future of that, uh, uh, of that plant species. But there's a time and a place for vegetative propagation, for, for cloning a plant essentially. Uh, so this is a swamp milkweed. Uh, there was, uh, I, I found it, uh, this cluster of four stems and then I separated them. In some cases, you don't even need the clippers. You can just kind of uh, tear them apart and each, um, each stem has its own uh, uh, root supply and then you plant them out in, in, in separate places and each one of them will then form a cluster. Vegetative propagation is also possible by layering. If you bury a stem, it'll, you will induce it to root and then you can sever it from the parent plant and plant that out. And cuttings are uh, surprisingly uh, common. Many, many plants can be uh, propagated this way simply by cutting a stem and putting in the pot, uh, taking off the lower leaves first. Uh, now here's a list of native plant nurseries in Massachusetts and a list of New England native plant seed companies. Uh, this will also be sent to you. Uh, I recommend them not only as sources of plants and seeds, but also sources of information. Uh, if you have uh, problematic uh, soil, for example, whether it's sandy or clayey, or whether you have a situation that's very shady, or, or if it's moist, or uh, what have you, the, the, uh, the experts who have a lot of experience in these nurseries and the uh, plant seed companies would be able to tell you uh, which plants would work well for you. Uh, another source of expertise is the master gardeners uh, who can answer questions. Uh, the Tower Hill Hortline is out of Boylston, Massachusetts, and uh, you can send them a photo for di ID or di diagnosis of a a plant that seems to, to be battling an illness and uh, they might give you some ideas of what you, how you can bring that plant back to health. You can join a garden club and learn a lot about plants that way and perhaps uh, trade plants with uh, fellow members. You can get to know other people in your neighborhood uh, who are gardeners and uh, people uh, often really enjoy uh, just learning from each other and, and being generous with each other. Uh, either with the plants themselves or with their knowledge. And it can also be fun to uh, participate in projects together. I've been, uh, orga I've been uh, 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 organizing people to uh, volunteer with the uh, Amherst Area Friends of Pollinators uh, in uh, establishing pollinator gardens on public land here in Amherst where I live. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like a, the spirit of a, uh, old-fashioned barn raising. You know, it's really, it's really fun to do things together and the work goes a lot faster as well. Uh, invite children to be stewards of nature. Uh, they will uh, have a, a wonderful appreciation of nature and they'll, uh, a, they'll have a self-confidence that, uh, uh, that will, uh, they'll, they'll just feel proud of being able to uh, raise plants themselves, uh, whether they're uh, raising plants for food or for wildlife. And uh, when, uh, when they love and respect nature, they'll, they'll grow up uh, to be advocates. And, and uh, we, we need all the en environmentalists out there that we can muster. In fact, each one of us can think of ourselves as an environmentalist in, of, a, uh, of one kind or another. So uh, all decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. So we, we need to be thinking not only of our descendants, but of, of the next generations of plants and animals that cannot speak for themselves. There's no limit to what we can do together. Start where you are and thank you for doing your part. So uh, I will now uh, stop sharing and I'd be interested in hearing any 
questions or comments you might have. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. There was lots of great information there, John. Um, maybe Abby and Erin, they want to go through the questions. Yeah. And if, the, if anybody who has any questions, you can put it in that question and answer tab down there and we'll try to go through them. Go ahead, Erin. All right, we do have some questions that were coming in, John, through your talk. I'm going to start at the top. Do some trees come in male or female? I heard mulberries do. And if so, how do you make sure you get the one that makes berries? Well, uh, if, uh, for, for example, there's a, a tree called winterberry, which I uh, showed uh, in my presentation. That's an example of a tree that uh, there are some males and some females. And uh, the nursery, that you pr purchase those trees for would surely have them labeled. And you need both, of course, because if you buy only males, well, there'll be no fruits. But if you buy only females, those flowers won't get pollinated. So they got to get them as a set. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, another question, um, and I think this re uh, is going back to like the mulching and, and so forth, is pine straw the needles? Is that the yeah. same thing as yeah, pine needles? Same, yeah, pine straw is pine needles. It's the same thing. Excellent. And then um, this comment came in. Someone told me foxglove is poisonous to pets. Is this correct? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all right. Um, could, I'm sure it's easy to find on the internet, though. Yeah. Um, and then there's one more that we have in the, the question area here. Um, what is the difference between Queen Anne lace and the wild carrot white-topped flowering plants? There is no difference. Ooh. In other words, same plant. That's just a different name for the same plant. Queen Anne's lace, wild carrot. Very cool. All right. <laughs> we don't have any other questions in the box, but I think if uh, anybody has any additional questions, maybe to put them either in the chat or into the, into the Q&A box there, that's okay too. I oddly enough know the foxglove answer. <laughs> um, they are, yes, they're, very, they're poisonous to humans as well and cats, mm -hmm. so <laughs> be very careful. <laughs> the source of the, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical digitalis mm -hmm. it comes from foxglove, yeah. I learned from Agatha Christie myself, but. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question. The mosquito dunks that you were talking about, yeah. um, if they're in a, 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 a pool of water, let's say, yeah. is that harmful to birds, those dunks? No, no, it's not. Okay, great. All right. We've had another question coming in. Um, with, and, and the question is, we are in firefly season, question mark? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen them myself. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty depressing, really, because, uh, I mean, I remember as a child, they were all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are five decades later, uh, the our numbers of everything are plummeting. And it, it's just, um, uh, it's so alarming. And it, and it really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's called the extinction crisis. And while we have the climate crisis, uh, which is also quite alarming and serious. Uh, I think the extinction crisis doesn't get as much press. Uh, the two are, are connected, but they're very different as well. If the climate crisis was suddenly solved ma magically, the extinction, extinction crisis would not be because, um, you know, the habitat, uh, loss of habitat is, is still there. The, the, the poisons in the environment are still there, regardless of what... Uh, what the CO2, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is. So, uh, uh, but it's one thing that we can really do something about. And that, you know, there's a, a, a concept called pollinator corridors. You can picture how important it is for, um, and this is true of a number of other species of wildlife as well, but for, uh, uh, for pollinators to be able to travel along these corridors and, and to be able to access different uh, parts of, the, of your community uh, that's that's what really makes a big difference. Uh, you know, just an isolated pollinator garden here or there might might be helpful, but it's much more important to have these, uh, you know, to be doing things on a large scale. 
So that's that's part that's part of why we need to be talking this up and talking to our officials and uh, you know making sure that uh, at every level of government uh, and uh, and society this, this is something that is and incidentally this week this National Pollinator Week June twenty first to twenty seventh so it's a good excuse to uh, uh, you know post something on Facebook or what have you. I have to say that I buy I bicycle and through some of the towns I've bicycled in, I'm seeing that there are, they, you can see signs and they're saying, this is a pollinator garden. That's great. And, and I've never seen that before. So yeah, that, it's, it's great when people do that because then, then it kind of reminds people that there's something that they can do with their, I mean, so many, so much of our land is non, unproductive, you know, we're not being used for food, not being used. And in fact, it has a negative environmental consequence because lawns, as I mentioned, are just, uh, really problematic. So um, why not use our land uh, either for growing food or attracting pollinators or both? Um, yeah, and other countries are uh, ha have done wonderful things. I know Ireland uh, has a national campaign that is just, uh, you know, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing it being featured, you know. So, uh, it, and there's a, a real sense of community pride that comes from uh, you know, we're, we've, we've got a wildlife sanctuary here or, a, you know, a pollinator sanctuary. I've seen it in um, some of the countries in Europe, uh, like the Czech Republic. <clears throat> yeah. They just have the most beautiful landscape and it's so natural and it's yeah. so full of life. And then mm -hmm. you visit there and you, you, you see just so much natural wildlife and then you come back here and you see yeah. all these sterile lawns yeah and it improves it improves our quality of life i mean who wants to go out and hang out on your sterile lawn i mean <laughs> but if you have a natural landscape there's so much going on around you uh it's it's just a it's a real joy right i agree if anyone has any other questions, did another oh, question come there's in? Uh, there's a comment that came in, and um, hi, Joan, I'm just going to shout out to you because this is one of my buddies from, from Melrose. Um, she is uh, promoting Grow Native Massachusetts. Every landscape matters, every garden counts, and it is a great local organization. They, uh, they're, they're very cool. That's a, yep. a nice one to look into. Mm -hmm. Let's see, there's just one more too here. Rachel has uh, just learned of a new native plant source nearby, uh, Oak Haven Sanctuary in uh, Levin Batch Elder Avenue, North Reading. So that could be something else too to check out. Great. <laughs> 11 Batch Elder Avenue in North Reading. You got it, Oak Haven Sanctuary. Great. All right, if there's no other questions, um, thank you very much. That was wonderful. There was lots of great information there. And thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Happy gardening. Thank you very much, John. Thanks so much. Okay, good night, everyone. And thank you for attending. Thank you.